Welcome back to Bible Answers with Pastor Mike. And we've got a question coming into us, an important one, uh, discussing uh, how somebody would go about examining their faith. Paul tells us to do that. Um, they want to know how, how would somebody go about examining their own faith? Well, it's a great question because a lot of people don't even like to think about examining their faith. And right. certainly if you're around here Compass, we're always going to uh, do what the Bible frequently does and ask the people, as we ask ourselves, are we sure we're of the faith? And the scripture has... Uh, I mean, if you just want to categorize it, two basic ways for us to look at whether or not we're genuinely saved. Number one, it's that there's a doctrinal test, mm. and number two, there's a practical test in terms of my life. The doctrinal test, of course, we have to look at what we're believing in the biblical gospel, uh, which is founded on the biblical Christ. And if we understand God rightly, if we understand Christ and his work rightly, if we understand uh, the nature and person of Christ and what he did for us and what it takes to respond to him in repentance and faith, well, then that's the biblical gospel. And we can check down that list and say, I believe these things mm -hmm. about God, about Christ, about my sin, about the response to the gospel. Uh, but then we need to turn the attention to what difference has that made in my life. The book of First John is a great book because in chapter 4, he's dealing with uh, the issue of the doctrinal test. Chapter 3, he's dealing with the issue of the practical test mm -hmm. of my life. It begins in chapter 1 by saying that no one's without sin, so we all know we have sin. The question in chapter 3 is, let's talk about that pattern of sin. Has yeah. it changed? You know, Are you continuing in sin? Mm -hmm. And as you know, in studying that text in 1 John 3, those verbs are all in the continuative tense. And, and so the idea is if we continue in sin, mm -hmm. right, it proves something about the reality of my faith. Sure. So we all sin, but the question is, has the encounter with Christ changed my life? But not, not even the negative aspects of, am I continuing in sin? But First John will say, we know we've come to know him if we keep his commandments. So it's the positive aspects yeah. that we should be looking and for. And the one as thing, well. as you know, in First John is always love. Do you love your yeah. brother, right? Which is then he says, it's not just words, mm. right? It's in deed and in truth. Mm -hmm. So there's, yeah, obviously, the actions of positive changed behavior. Mm -hmm. And if you want to look at it from like the perspective of Galatians 5, yeah. If I have the Spirit of God in my life, mm. okay, there's works of the flesh that if I just let myself do what I want, here's the outcome. Mm -hmm. But if I'm filled with the Spirit, then the fruit of that, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, those kinds of things right. will be evident in my life. And the problem is if you look at that fruit list right there, uh, people can say, well, of course I love, right? The fruit of the Spirit is love. Well, yeah, I love. Jesus made the distinction in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, listen, the Gentiles, the tax collectors, they, they love those who love them. Mm -hmm. right? They're good to those that are good to them. What difference is there in you if you just do that? Mm -hmm. So every non-Christian, every tax collector, every gang member, every criminal in jail, they love somebody. Mm -hmm. right? The question for Christians is, is the fruit of the Spirit demonstrating a kind of uniqueness in your love, in right. your joy, in your peace and patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control? Which Jesus would say you got to love your enemy. That's how that whole thing started, Correct. right? That's the different the different type of love that's that Christian type of it's love. It's a kind of love that is not natural. Yeah, it's foreign. It's yeah. a, and just like, and I think of the, you know, peace. Here's uh, Paul and Barnabas in prison there in Acts mm. after being beaten, flogged yeah. in stocks in prison in Philippi singing mm. hymns to God. There's a peaceful heart there. That's a peace that transcends all understanding to yeah. quote Philippians, the idea of a peace that doesn't come from the flesh. Yeah. It's not a natural thing. Mm. So we need to look for those kinds of unnatural things. Self-control is one, which mm. gets back to the issue of sin. Mm. Is there a kind of self-control that holds back certain words, certain actions, certain attitudes that our flesh wants to erupt with, right. but the fruit of the Spirit, because I have the Spirit in my life, mm -hmm. there's a pattern of restraint. Right. Now, of course, again, you got to go back to, you got to start in John 1, 1 John 1, which reminds us, it doesn't mean perfection. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people want to shy away from the whole idea of testing myself because they say, you know, you're arguing for perfection. We're not arguing for perfection, right? We're arguing what the Bible argues. And that is we know no one is without sin. Mm -hmm. As James says, we all stumble in many ways. We know that with our words. We're all going to stumble with our words. But the question is, is there evidence of the Spirit of God in your life? Mm -hmm. So doctrinal test, mm -hmm. are we talking about the same Jesus? Are we talking about the same God? Are we talking mm -hmm. about the same gospel? Are we talking about now a changed life? Mm -hmm. Do I see evidence of that? Mm -hmm. So we've got to look at the doctrinal test, the behavioral test, or the change of my life test, sure. which is going to, another way to say it is, is there any evidence of the Spirit of God in your life that is changing you? Mm -hmm. Any man's in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, new creation. Mm -hmm. Old things go away, new things come. There's got to be a point of 
turning. Mm -hmm. and, and one thing we should address, if we have time here real quickly, is people that grow up in church that say, well, you know, I've always been a Christian, or I've always had this trajectory of, of God life, and so, you know, I don't have that turning point you're talking about. Every person has a turning point, mm -hmm. right? Think about it. Every kid is born wired for themselves. And just earlier in that passage, 2 Corinthians 5, 15, it says that, you know, Christ came, he died for us, that those who live should no longer live for themselves. Every infant is born living for themselves. Yeah. So at some point, even if you grew up in a pastor's home and you were good and dutiful and careful about your life, there's a point in which the whole motive of your life changes because the Spirit of God indwells you. Mm. And now you live for Him. Mm. And that has to be a kind of a, of a transformation of new creation that 2 Corinthians 5.17 talks about. So, uh, yeah, there has to be evidence of the doctrine is biblical. Mm. Now the fruit of the Spirit is biblically evident in my life. Well, so we have the objective test of the doctrine, and we have the subjective test of those either putting off sin, putting on righteousness, trials, those types of things. Are we called to then look at other people and judge in their life or make evidence in their life of if they're a Christian or not that way? Well, I wouldn't make that the pattern, only sure. in that the Scripture does call us as parishioners, if you will, to beware of false teachers. Yeah and you will know them by their fruits, Jesus said. Right. The, the wolves will come in sheep's clothing. So be careful who you listen to. Be, mm -hmm. be careful who you go to for biblical advice and direction right. and preaching, because if there is a contradiction, as Second Peter and Jude says, and, and as Jesus is getting out on the Sermon on the Mount, if there is fruit that defies right. their claim, See, then you've got to recognize you shouldn't listen to them. Well, I think even along the lines of Ephesians 5, I think he says, let no one deceive you with empty words. And he goes on to talk about the things that they practice bring the wrath of God. So I've got to expose even those deeds of unrighteousness sure. at that point in time. Absolutely. And even within the church there that, that the writer of Hebrews writes to, you know, see to it that no root of bitterness grow up among you. See to it that the people enter the rest. Right. There's always these third person imperatives where you have to mm -hmm. make sure your brothers are entering the rest and you, you, you have true faith. And sure. so there is a sense in which I care about my brothers. Yeah. There's, there's that sense of it. sitting in the lifeguard tower, narking people on their lives. That's sure. not the view of the New Testament. Right. There's a very clear direction that I got to judge the, the teacher to make sure I'm, I'm not following a wolf. Right. And then I care about my brothers yeah. enough that if someone claims Christ, mm. like Paul says to Titus, they profess him with their mouths, but they deny him with their deeds. If I see that mm -hmm. because I love someone, I'm going to care enough to right. say, hey, let, let's, you know, let's get back to objective tests, subjective tests, right. look at your life and let's make sure you're, you're really that's converted. The, that's a transition in Galatians 5 to 6. It says, if you're producing the fruit of the Spirit, you who are spiritual, 6-1, Find someone who's in sin and restore them a spirit right. of gentleness as a brother would do That's that. That's right. That's good. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the question. And again, if you have any other questions for us, email us at askpastormike at compasschurch.org. We'd love to help you out.